every day. Hospitals, EMS services, and lay people across the globe use Zoll products to save lives. So, <clears throat> so very good afternoon to all of you. Um, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, as a hematologist, I'm sometimes also not called a uh, blood doctor, or more commonly, just a bloody doctor. So I do see, <laughs> so I do see a fair bit of uh, blood in my uh, everyday work, but probably not the kind that you see in the emergency uh, setting. <clears throat> So the title of my talk today, of course, is on reversal of dabigatran uh, ataxylate and what are the current strategies as well as findings from the reverse uh, AD trials. Now, as I uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, this is a sponsored talk. And of course, it has to be declared that the talk is sponsored by Boringer Ingelheim, who is um, the manufacturer of dabigatran ataxylate. Right? So although reversal of um, the new oral anticoagulants, of course, is of interest, but for the purpose of this talk, you'll be focused uh, largely on reversal of uh, dabigatran. Now, um, you, you might know that dabigatran, of course, is one of curr three currently available um, direct oral anticoagulants in the market in Singapore, with the other two being uh, apixaban as well as rivaroxaban. Now, some of you also know that the uh, modality of action of the uh, three agents are somewhat different. Dabigatran is quite, it's called as a direct uh, thrombin inhibitor. And the uh, rivaroxaban as well as apixaban are what is known as anti-10A inhibitors. As a class, of course, they are called uh, NORAX. They are started they are being called as NORAX, or what stands for Novel Oral Anticoagulants. Now, of course, things have changed because the first introduction of the NORAX, uh, when we first did clinical trials, was back in 2006. And in 2008, of course, uh, the first of the, um, the uh, oral new oral anticoagulants was introduced into the Sing Singapore market, and that was dabigatran, whereby it was used for prophylaxis of orthopedic patients undergoing major orthopedic uh, surgical procedures. We now don't call them uh, novel oral anticoagulants because it's been close to almost 10 years since we've been introduced. So people prefer to call them as direct oral anticoagulants or DOAX. But if you like to stick to the name NORAX, it's called non uh, vitamin K oral anticoagulants or NOX. Right? Now, the, the, um, the indications for the NOX, of course, has expanded over time. So instead of just giving, being given as prophylaxis for patients uh, undergoing orthopedic surgical procedures, we now use it, of course, for patients with atrial fibrillation. We also use it for treatment of patients with uh, venous thromboembolism and as well as pulmonary embolism. And for rivaroxaban, of course, there's also an increasing uh, expansion of the indications to even patients with acute coronary syndromes, whereby they can be put on the medication for up to a year. So the long and short of it, of course, is that you will increasingly get to see more and more patients in our setting in Singapore and perhaps in many other places in the world who are on the novel or the direct oral anticoagulants or DOAX. And, and as with all anticoagulants, for it to be effective, it has to prevent blood from clotting. And once, of course, you are an effective anticoagulant, the downside of it, of course, is that you will get bleeding complications. Right? And there's no doubt about it. Irrespective of the anticoagulants that you use, be it the newer compounds or good old warfarin as well as heparin, across the board, the risk of major bleeding for any patients who is on anticoagulant is about 3%. And when we say major bleeding, it means that bleeding that is sufficient to be potentially life-threatening, which can be either into the GI tract and more importantly, of course, into the intracranial uh, site uh, as an intracranial bleeding. So this may be a typical patient that you might see uh, ending up in your uh, accident and emergency uh, uh, unit. Male patient who is, has got chronic atrial fibrillation, who is on dabigatran, Unfortunately, because of his cardiac condition, he also has an implantable cardi uh, cardioverter defibrillator, and he developed a, ve a ventricular fibrillation while he was starting his overseas journey. Now, this is a real story whereby this guy had uh, a VF when he was in Changi Airport, and, and his uh, uh, implantable, his ICD uh, worked perfectly, it fired. But as a result of that, he lost consciousness for a brief period of time. He fell, and he hit his head. Because he's on anticoagulant, of course, he was brought to the A&E, and of course, a scan shows that he has actually a hematoma. Right? Now, as much as the newer anticoagulants touts that, of course, that the risk of intracranial bleeding is lower for the direct oral anticoagulants, but you cannot prevent patients from falling and hitting their head unless, of course, you make them walk about with a helmet all the time, which is not what we want to do for our patients. 
Now, a number of years ago, this is almost about three years ago, we realized that, of course, there will be situations whereby you will see patients with bleeding, irrespective of the anticoagulants that we use. So because the novel oral anticoagulants are a new class of drugs, we decided, of course, to publish this consensus uh, paper, which you will be you be able to find in the, um, in the annals of the Academy of Medicine uh, Singapore. I think it's free, it's available uh, uh, online, so you can always call up these people if you do need to. Right? And we gave you some guidance, of course, as to what are the things that you should look out for if you do have a patient who is receiving the new compounds coming uh, to the hospital with a bleeding complication. Right? Now, because the focus, of course, is in the Dabigatran, and I have a talk, another talk tomorrow whereby I'll be discussing in more general terms about reversal, of anticoagulant uh, medications. I will not go through this in details. Right, but briefly, of course, when you do have a patient who is on an anticoagulant coming to see you in the emergency department with bleed, what do you, are the things that you do? I think most important, of course, is for us to actually try as best as we can to classify the bleed. I think in a, a, as an emergency physicians, most of you will know very well that you triage your bleed as much, uh, try your patients as much as possible. And the same thing applies as far as a patient who is actually bleeding, right? So look out for what the bleeds are and so on. And I would classify the bleeds into various categories. The first category, of course, is the ones whereby you say, ah, yeah, this kind of bleed also want to come to emergency department, right? <laughs> what I would call, right, examples of that would be gum bleeding, small bruises after knocks, after a fight or something. Perhaps if they will have to have URTI symptoms, they get cough, they get blow their nose, they get a little bit of uh, streaks of uh, blood. And of course, sometimes if they do have uh, hemorrhoids and so on, sometimes they may get a little bit of blood after going to the toilets or small cuts. Something that we call nuisance bleeding. Right? If you don't understand the term nuisance bleeding, if your boss or your spouse or your parents or your, uh, calls you a nuisance, you're actually not too bad. You're a little bit bothersome, a bit of an irritant, but you are quite harmless. Right? And I, well, I can tell you that you probably will be calling your boyfriends a nuisance, but the, the guys in the room should probably never call their girlfriends a nuisance, right? It's a sure way that you have to look for a new girlfriend if you do do that. But essentially, if you have nuisance bleeding, we don't do anything because they are usually harmless bleeding. Now, you sometimes get mild bleeding, and when we say mild bleeding, it can include nose bleeds. It tends to be a little bit more torrential. You may get small superficial hematomas, small superficial cuts, or sometimes hematuria. If you do get a patient presenting with that on an anticoagulant, you don't usually need to do very much other than to withhold a dose or two of the novel oral anticoagulants. And because of the short half-life of the novel oral anticoagulants, by the next day, the bleeding will probably stop and you can resume the oral anticoagulants as per usual without doing any other uh, 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 additional procedures or additional interventions. But the bleeding can sometimes be uh, severe or potentially life-threatening. And by that, of course, we, these are some of the examples that you see of patients presenting to you. And of course, what is most feared, of course, is bleeding into critical sites, like, for example, intracranial bleeding, spinal bleeding, or bleeding with hemodynamic instability. And that's the one that should really come to the emergency department and will end up under your care. And what should you do if you do get such kind of patients presenting to your, um, to your ED? Well, of course, general measures should prevail. You should always have an IV catheter uh, to resuscitate the patient if there is a profound hypotension, if there's substantial blood loss. Obviously, you need to resuscitate the patient. Right? Correct acidosis and hypoxia. And of course, hypothermia is not usually a, a thing of great concern in our part of the world. But in situations whereby hypothermia does exist together with acidosis and, and hypoxia, we do know that it very much affects the ability of your blood to clot. So you do need to correct that as much as possible. And last but not least, of course, I think you'll all be aware of that mechanical compression, if possible, is fundamental for controlling any bleed, irrespective of whether the patient is on an anticoagulant or not. Now, if you were to be able to take a little bit of history, and nowadays, of course, we can assess the medical records of most of our patients and see what the medications that they are on, and you realize that, of course, they are on drugs called dabigatran or apixaban, idoxaban, and rivaroxaban. I think to some of us in the audience who may not be very uh, uh, familiar with these drugs, such names still confuses you as to what class of drug that there is. But if you do see them, they are actually the direct oral anticoagulants. And as mentioned earlier on, dabigatran is a, the oral direct thrombin inhibitor. The apixaban, idoxaban, and rivaroxaban are oral factor 10A inhibitors. If your patient comes in with a bleed and you do need to reverse them, right? The, uh, currently, there's no approved antidote available for this drug. Right? Some people don't like to use the term antidote. They rather use the term reversal 
agent. So if you have been using warfarin and you have got a lot of patients who comes to the, to the ED with uh, who's on warfarin or on heparin for that matter, we do know that you can give fresh frozen plasma for patients on warfarin. You can give four-factor PCC for those on, uh, on warfarin. Or if the patient is on heparin, of course, obviously, you have protamin sulfate. But currently for the DOACs, there's currently no approved antidote or reversal agent that is available in Singapore. So by and large, of course, the general measures that we can use, of course, the, the hemostatic agents that is uh, touted to be available for the bleeding complications associated with this, of course, is four-factor uh, plasma concentrates, which is uh, a combination of factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. This is actually available in most hospitals in Singapore. I know that's available in SGH, NUH, Tantok Singh Hospital, Changi Hospital, and I think even in Kutek Quad Hospital, they have four-factor PCC. It is available and is the preferred agent for the reversal of warfarin. But you can also use it if you do not uh, if for the reversal of any of these agents, even though they are not specific. But there have been some reports and we have some experience in using it for patients who have bleeding associated with rivaroxaban. The other agents that are available and more uh, specialized, of course, is fiber, which is actually a compound that is used for the treatment of uh, patients, uh, hemophilia patients with inhibitors. And I think that this is only available in the three major hospitals, that's uh, KK Hospital, SGH, as well as NUH. But recombinant factor 7A, of course, is used sometimes for trauma surgeons, so you should, you should be able to find recombinant factor activated factor 7 available in most of the hospitals in Singapore. But there are general hemostatic agents. They are not specific for reversal of any of the anticoagulants. Can you then remove the uh, oral anticoagulants? The answer is yes, if your patient is on dabigatran, but it is via hemodialysis and you have hemofiltration, especially with a charcoal filter, you can remove dabigatran. But I think in truth, of course, is that you, it is almost difficult, if not impossible, for a patient who is unstable, who is on an anticoagulant, who is bleeding, for you to organize hemodialysis or hemofiltration to remove dabigatran, even though it can be removed, right? So usually, of course, if, that's, if you were to use this, it's only in a situation whereby the patient is stable. But if your patient is in the classical low molecular weight heparin from the paradox, which we do not have here, but some of you who may be from Malaysia, of course, uses a lot of uh, from the paradox. Or if you're on, on any of the oral factor 10 inhibitors like apixaban, uh, um, rivaroxaban, and uh, edoxaban, it is not dialysable. So it will be a futile effort if you were to try to organize dialysis because you cannot remove them. The other question, of course, is can you use activated charcoal for patients uh, who has just consumed the drug? Yes, there's some evidence that if your patient is on dabigatran and it's less than three hours, you can use activated charcoal because it does reduce the absorption of the drug if the patient presents with uh, bleeding. And while there is no good quality published evidence available for the oral 10A inhibitors, if a patient presents to the ED department within about two to three hours, I would still give them activated charcoal to try to reduce the absorption of the anticoagulants. But as much as we say that there is no reversible agent that is available, it has been in development for a while now. And you look at the, uh, the status of the de reversal agent development, three of them are currently in development. The first one is either rusucinumab, which targets dabigatran, and there's another compound called endosonate alpha, which targets the factor 10A inhibitors, apixaban, rivaroxaban, as well as edoxaban. And last but not least, of course, is another drug called PER977 or siraparentac, which is touted to be a universal reversal agent for all anticoagulants. Now, among the three, the one that is in most advanced phases of development is either rusizumab. In fact, it has been approved by the FDA as well as the European Medi uh, Medication um, um, uh, Authority uh, for, for use in Europe as well as in, um, as well as in the US itself. And in Singapore, of course, it has been submitted for regulatory approval for use for reversal of dabigatran. So I'll give you, uh, in the next few slides, of course, some um, uh, uh, evidence of the value of idiorizuzumab for the reversal of uh, dabigatran. It is a monoclonal factor, um, uh, monoclonal uh, antibody. It is a, essentially the AB, uh, FAB portion of the uh, immunoglobulins. And the use of the monoclonal antibody or an antibody to reverse drugs is actually not a new concept. Right. Um, antibodies has been available for the reversal of some of the other agents apart from just dabigatran alone. And this is currently, of course, the structure. It is either rusizumab, of course, the reversal agent is a humanized FAB fragment of, um, 
antibody that has been developed in mouse models targeting uh, against um, dabigatran. It has a high affinity to dabigatran. It binds by more than 350 times the uh, uh, binding capacity of dabigatran to thrombin, because tr dabigatran does uh, target thrombin. And it binds in an irreversible fashion as opposed to dabigatran, which binds to thrombin in a reversible fashion. Uh, uh, fashion. It is not known to have any intrinsic procoagulant or anticoagulant activity. And to use it, of course, you give it by IV dosing, and it has got a short half-life. It has been tested, of course, pr uh, primarily uh, in the first place in healthy volunteers. And when it was given to healthy volunteers who were taking dabigatran for four days prior to being given the, uh, the uh, reversal agent or idarucizumab, this, of course, is a measure of the amount of uh, dabigatran that is available by a measure called the dilute thrombin time. And this, of course, is in patients just given placebo. But in those who have been given either rizuzumab, there is a rapid reduction of the levels of dabigatran in the plasma of healthy volunteers who have been given the uh, drugs itself. So it's complete uh, and sustainable reversal of anticoagulant effect of dabigatran in healthy volunteers. And in the healthy volunteer study, there's been no drug-related uh, adverse events. It is well to uh, tolerated by patients. There are no procoagulant effects, as uh, earlier said, and no relevant changes in any of the investigated safety parameters for patients who have been given uh, the ida map. And there's no immunogenic reactions uh, that are of significance in patients given this drug itself. Right. So the developers, which is the Boringer Ingelheim of ida map, has then moved on to um, testing or conducting clinical trials in actual patients uh, itself. And the study that involves actual patients is called the reverse AD study. It has two arms, one arm being given to patients who are bleeding patients, and the other arm to patients who are not bleeding but who requires emergency surgical procedures, whereby you want to, uh, to reverse the anticoagulant effect as much as possible. The trial was started in April 2014 in 35 countries, and in Singapore, the sites whereby the reverse AD trial is conducted is in uh, SGH, Changi, Ho Changi Hospital, as well as uh, NUH. So the trial is currently still running, uh, and, uh, and the um, SGH A&E, of course, is one of the sites for which the uh, trial is currently being conducted. It will close sometime in June, but if we do have patients coming in, they are possibly qualified for this study. All right. So the, the, the design of the study goes like this. As I said, the first group, of course, is for uncontrolled bleeding. The second group is for patients with emergency surgical procedures. And if they qualify uh, by the criteria for the study itself, how it does is that you give either resource map as 5 grams in two separate 2.5 grams uh, uh, valves for the patients. And, of course, they are monitored for the primary endpoint as well as multiple safety endpoints. Right? And the, even though the trial is still... Uh, uh, um, Running, the preliminary findings, of course, of, uh, involving close to about 100 patients has already been published in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine. Right? And of course, this is the diversity of the patients who were on the clinical trial across different uh, doses of dabigatran and, of course, at different times for which they have ingested the dabigatran. For the patients uh, as well, there are most of the patients, of course, are elderly patients because the majority of the patients are those with atrial fibrillation given dabigatran. I've got different ranges in terms of the uh, renal function uh, itself, all the way from patients with reduced renal function with those with normal renal function. And this, of course, is the finding of the study whereby if either resistance map is given in the first group with uncontrolled bleeding, and this is a measure by the dilute thrombin time of either resistance map before the or rather dabigatran before idarizumab is given, you find that the correction in terms of the dabigatran is almost near complete after you've given idarizumab. And the same thing goes for another measure called the ethylene clotting time for this. In the patients undergoing emergency surgical procedures given idarizumab, the same thing happens whereby idarizumab was able to reverse the effect of dabigatran almost completely for patients. And of course, all the um, um, endpoints, um, the efficacy endpoints of the clinical study was achieved by way of measurements of the direct thrombin time as well as the acrine clotting time itself. So in closing, if you currently have a patient who is taking dabigatran that ends up in your emergency department in Singapore itself, what are the current strategies for reversing that patient if the patient comes in with a life-threatening bleed for which you think that the bleeding can be stopped if you were to take away or at least uh, take away the effect of dabigatran. This is how you would do it. As we have said, that idarizumab is only available in the US and Europe at the current time point, but it's been submitted to the regulatory uh, uh, bodies, which is HSA in uh, Singapore itself. 
So according to Boringer Ingelheim, perhaps we would have to wait at least until, until the end of the year, if not next year, before it is approved. But there is likely going to be an early uh, access program for patients being given dabigatran. If you currently have a patient admitted today to the emergency department of either one of these three hospitals, you can consider um, recruiting this patient into the reverse AD, style, uh, uh, AD study, which is still uh, running, whereby they can potentially be given either resource map for reversal of the anticoagulants. And of course, if you are working in institutions whereby there is, they are not participating in this study itself, you then have to consider the use of four-factor PCC, which is usually given at a dose of 50 uh, units per kilogram, Fiber, if you are uh, working in, in some of this hospital, or recombinant factor 7A as reversal agent for patients who are on anticoagulants using dabigatran. I think with that, I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, for this uh, talk and also the next one, we will have the question and answer session now. So if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. Yes. Thank you for sharing with us that because it is a troublesome thing that we encounter in A&E. I'm from CGH, so very aware of the uh, Idarosizumab uh, study. Um, so what we do when the patient comes to us, sometimes we are not sure if they are really on the bigger trend. Yes. And uh, we might do the APTT, yeah. uh, perhaps not the DTT or the Ekarin test. Yeah. Uh, is, that, is that one good way to look at it? And uh, another question is, uh, the trial that was shared was, I, I'm not familiar with the trial, but uh, perhaps that at some time it will be compared to what we call standard care mm -hmm. instead of, uh, I, I think this is just studying those who receive it. Am I right? Yes. Uh, so the first question, of course, is, is there any coagulation parameters that you can use to estimate or, um, whether a patient still has uh, dabigatran on board. So you may have a situation whereby the patient tells you that they are taking dabigatran, uh, and by the time they come to see you, you uh, see you with bleeding, you want to know whether the bleeding is caused by dabigatran. So I said, of course, one of the tests that you can use, of course, is uh, AP, uh, APTT. But the APTT is, is uh, it does two things. At the very high levels, it levels off in the sense that it's not a good reflection of how high the dose is. But if you have a patient who is actually bleeding, what you actually want to know is whether there's a residual effect that is left uh, of the dabagatran. Now, the APTT, unfortunately, is not sensitive enough. And even if you have a, a normal APTT, it does not exclude the presence of dabagatran in the patient. So the best test to use to estimate whether there's still dabagatran available is to order a thrombin time. Right? Now, what you see as a, direct, uh, uh, as a dilute thrombin time there is, is a specific test uh, that's available for estimating the level of the uh, drug. And the other test, of course, is called the acrine clotting time, but it's not available in Singapore except in Tantok Singh Hospital. And usually you don't get it back within uh, an, an hour or so. So the best test for you to order is actually a thrombin time, or the synonym to that is actually thrombin clotting time. And, you, and that, of course, can be ordered in any hospital because the automated machines will run it and you can get it back as fast as a PTT. So if your, TT, if your thrombin time comes back as normal, it means the patient has got no anticoagulant effect because the thrombin time is actually very sensitive. Right? And of course, the other question, of course, as to whether, of course, it, be, it will become a standard test uh, uh, product that's available. The answer is yes. I think that if it's approved uh, by the regulatory authorities, I think most hospitals should keep it. Uh, but it's going to be a few thousand dollars uh, cost. And before it's approved, there's going to be an early access program, but the early access program is going to be limited to five institutions. As far as I currently hear, Changi Hospital is not one of them. I'm trying to see whether Changi Hospital, because you do see a lot of trauma, should be actually one of them, rather than some of the private hospitals. Okay. Sorry, just to clarify, my question was the standard care. Mm. Uh, not as a standard care, it's like standard yeah. care meaning like yeah. Mm. Factor, yeah. and, and that is one group and the other group randomized to perhaps the use of this targeted antidote uh, but there hasn't been anything like that no, uh, there probably will never be a study like that because uh, there is some animal studies as well as in, uh, in healthy volunteers as well that fiber as well as four factor PCC do not correct adequately um, patients who are on dabigatran so it's probably uh, unethical for you to actually conduct a study when you do have either resistance map with uh, it's demonstrated that it's actually effective in reversing the effect or comparing the efficacy because the other one is not specific. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions?